this morning going through the book of First Thessalonians in chapter 4. So we're going to uh, focus in on that even more so. And, you know, it's so important because, as I said this morning already, currently we're living in such a highly obsessive, sexualized culture that makes, listen to me, it makes sexual temptation more accessible, I believe, than any time in our history. Think about it. Pornography, for example, and I'm talking about pictures, videos, talk, and text, anything that will sexually arouse a person, especially a male, it's a major problem that affects men and boys. Did you know that 50% of porn users first viewed porn by the time they were 13 years of age? 50%. And the fact of the matter is, it's not just pornography is not just something that impacts men and boys anymore. Now, women and girls are into it. When I was a kid, Pornography was only available in CD stores. Or if your friend's dad got Playboy and your friend showed you uh, his dad's magazine. But now the vilest pictures that you can imagine are just a few clicks on any electronic device. It, it This is the sad part. It's even part of the fake sex education curriculum in our elementary schools. Pornography. So let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 4 because this city, this port city, ancient city of Thessalonia, by the way, there's a, there is a current modern day city. It's called uh, Salonica. It's the modern version of this ancient city. It was a port city. A lot of sailors coming in and out, traffic, trade. And also, as I said this morning, it was part of their pagan religion. Prostitution was part of their pagan religion. So it was totally acceptable. And that's what these people were saved out of. And they're very, very young Christians. And so they're struggling. And so Paul is very right to talk as plain as he does. Pick up with me in verse 3 of First Thessalonians 4. And here he says, this is the will of God. Let's stop there a moment. You know, sometimes believers struggle to know God's will. I wonder if it's God's will for me to take this job. I wonder what God's will is concerning marriage. I wonder who God wants me to marry. We struggle with the will of God. I understand that. But there's one thing concerning the will of God that none of us should ever question. And that's this. Here is the will of God for you if you're a believer. Your sanctification, i.e., that is, that you should abstain, avoid fornication. Let's stop there a moment. God wants us as believers to live sexually pure lives. And a sexually pure life is a life that is set apart from fornication. Let's unpack that word again. See that word fornication in that third verse? Here's what it refers to. I said in the morning that it is an umbrella term. And by that, I mean there are a lot of different kinds of sexual immoral acts that fall under that. Pornography is just one of them. Viewing pornography would be considered fornication. But also any sexual relationship outside of, listen to me, heterosexual marriage. Know what I mean by that? One man and one woman married, legally married. Anything outside of that could be considered fornication. 
And so you could be talking about premarital sex, extramarital sex, which would be adultery, uh, homosexuality, uh, prostitution, incest, masturbation, bestiality. I mean, I hate to even mention these things, but that's all under the topic of fornication. And I want you to see this very clearly in verse 3. God's will for you is live a life that is set apart to God and totally avoid, totally abstain from, total abstinence from sexual immorality. That means not moderation, but total abstinence. Absolute. Well, how do you do that? How do you live like that? That's a good question. And it's an important question. And I want to try to help you just in a brief uh, time that we have together to think through that. And I would say, first of all, in order to be sexually pure, it's going to require your cooperation with God. You're going to have to have cooperation. God will never demand anything of you and I that he will not also enable us to accomplish. If God says he wills for you and I to completely, totally abstain from sexual immorality, then God's going to help you. God's going to enable you. God's going to give you the ability to do that. Otherwise, he'd be mocking you if he wouldn't enable you to accomplish that. But for that to happen, for you to abstain from fornication, from you, for you to be sexually pure in all of these areas, and perhaps I didn't even mention all of them. I don't know. I just thought of a list in my head and wrote them down. For you to abstain from it, you it requires your cooperation with God. And you'll never cooperate with God unless you really, really want to be pure. Do you want to be pure? Do you like messing up your life? Do you like playing around sexually? I mean, if you're not saved, I understand. That's, that's all you know. That's all you do. That's what you live for. But the Bible says that when you get saved, your, your human spirit is joined to the Holy Spirit of God. You become a partaker of the divine nature. And what that means is the Holy Spirit moves into your spirit, resides in you permanently. And when he does, he gives you a totally new list of desires. You still have your natural desires, and some of them aren't good. But God gives you his desires. And so I want to ask you this afternoon, whoever you are, if you're a believer, do you have a desire for purity? Because God says that's what he wants. That's what pleases him. We're to live to please God according to verse 1. We're to walk and to please God by our sexual lives. You have a desire, that's where it begins. You cooperate with God because you want to be pure. God puts that desire. Now, you can bury it. You can ignore it. You can, but, but deep down in your heart of hearts, if you're a believer, you have a desire to be pure. You have a desire to not to participate in fornication, in immorality, because you want to please God. For that to happen, you have to cooperate, first of all, by desiring it, and then you have to cooperate with God by asking and taking by faith his ability. The moment you're tempted, ask and take his ability to not give in to that temptation. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to not ask and take the ability 
to overcome that temptation. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in a few minutes. Secondly, what does it involve to abstain, as he says, from fornication, to absolutely, absolute total abstinence from uh, sexual immorality? How can I be pure? Cooperation. There's another thing that I have called contemplation. By that, I mean sexual impurity doesn't begin in an act. It begins in your heart. It begins in your mind. It begins in your thinking. That's why Jesus said, the law of Moses said that thou shalt not commit adultery. But he said, Jesus said, I say, if a, a man looks on a woman and desires to have a sexual relationship with her, Jesus said that man has already committed adultery, has, all, uh, has already fornicated, you might say, in his own heart. So contemplate. Sexual impurity begins in your thinking. It begins in your heart. It begins in your... Remember, again, Jesus says, don't worry about whether you're eating defiled food, non-kosher food. He said, you should be more worried about the evil that comes out of your evil heart. And one of those is adulteries and, and fornication, sexual immorality. It stems from our heart. Uh, on a, a, a just, It's called in the Bible sometimes the, the flesh. It's the soul of man. It's in the process of being redeemed from the evil that is in it. We That soul uh, still has indwelling sin living in it. So sexual impurity begins in your heart, in your soul, in your mind. And that tells me this. We need to learn to control our thinking. We need to learn to control our thought life. And one way that you won't control your thought life is if you feed on sensual material. If you feed your thinking on sensual movies and television shows and online stuff, if you feed on that, you'll never be able to control your thinking. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, that the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of these evil strongholds in our thinking. And, and he says that we can, by his power and ability, bring every one of our thoughts into the captivity of Christ so that we don't have to think that way. There is control over, it depends on what you feed. If you're watching the wrong stuff, if you're looking at the wrong stuff, if you're cogitating and contemplating uh, the wrong stuff, you are feeding your sensual mind. And that eventually becomes activity. It begins in the mind. And that's why contemplation is so important that you not be conform to this world, but rather you be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Instead of feeding it sensuality, renew your mind by feeding it God's truth. And that may not be just the Bible, but uh, the truth of God. A fellowship with, with people that will encourage you to sexual purity instead of talking about and uh, innuendos regarding immorality. Remember, again, how Paul also puts it in Philippians chapter 4, where he's, he's talking about having God's peace in our heart and life. And he says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are right, whatever things, listen to this, are pure. Think on these things. Pure. Don't feed on sensuality. Don't watch that movie. Don't look at that television program. Don't click on that website. Don't look at that DVD. 
Don't read that material. Discount that text. Whatever form it might take. Put the right stuff. Control your thinking. Contemplation. Here's a, a third thing that I believe in uh, will be involved in moral purity in our lives. Not only cooperation and contemplation, but I wanted it to match. I'll explain the word capitulation. You know what it means to capitulate? It means to surrender. It means to yield or surrender. And so when I say capitulation, what I mean is that you surrender your body and your soul to the Lord. That you surrender your body and soul to the Lord, to his control. Again, I beg you, Paul says, I beg you. I'm on my knees. I'm begging you. I beseech you on the basis of all that God has done for you. Please present your body to the Lord, not to yourself, not to your desires, but to the Lord as a living sacrifice. God, he, here am I, and I want you to have all that there is of me from head to toe, inside and out, Lord, all that there is of me, I present myself to you. That's what I mean by capitulation. You present your body and soul to the Lord. You yield your body and soul to him by restricting your sexual activity to nothing else but marriage. Now, let me say this. I did a couple's retreat uh, the first weekend of this month of February, and I was very candid with these married couples about marriage. You know, God's the inventor. <laughs> God designed marriage, and it's meant to be uh, something very wonderful and pleasurable as well. In fact, there should be no guilt when it comes to uh, sexual relations between a legally married husband and wife, heterosexual marriage. No guilt whatsoever. Here's what God says. The marriage bed, and he's talking about sexual relationships between a husband and a wife. The marriage bed is honorable in all things. That's how God sees it. It's totally honorable. God doesn't say, oh, you know, that's dirty. Not when it comes to marriage, because he's the one that thought it up. He says it's honorable and all, but he says, here's the warning. Whoremongers and adulterers. God's going to judge. He's going to, they're not going to get away with it. You know, it's not the, how many notches you have in your belt. That doesn't fly with God. You're going to pay in one way or another. He chastens. God will judge. Now, you know, you don't have to be a woman to be a whore. You, you, men can be whores, right? And uh, men can be whoremongers. Just live whorishly. Just trying to, as much as they can, just satisfy their animalistic desires, right? Actually, it's human. But anyway, I wanted that to be clear about marriage. There's no embarrassment. There's no dishonor when it comes to a sexual relationship as a legally married husband and wife. And that's, that's God looks on it as something that he encourages and completely accepts. And so yield your body and your soul to God's control. And you ready for this? Part of the capitulation as a married person, yield your body to your spouse in regular, faithful, enjoyable sexual relationships. You say, what? Where is that? I'm going to read it to you. And then I want you to, uh, as, as a husband and wife, take it to heart and apply it. 
Now, concerning things that you wrote unto me, here's what I have to say. To avoid fornication. Remember what the word fornication meant? All, that umbrella term that takes in all forms of sexual immorality and impurity. To avoid that, Paul says, that every man have his wife, his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. And let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud not. Remember what he said in First Thessalonians 4? How that if you have a, a, a relationship, sexual relationship out of marriage with another person, you defraud that person. You take advantage of them. You cheat them. But he says, don't cheat your spouse by holding back in the sexual relationship, except it be for consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And then come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So in the mutuality of marriage, each person's body doesn't belong to themselves, but in marriage belongs to their spouse. Isn't that interesting? So there is a yielding. Sexual purity involves yielding. Your body, your soul to God, and as a married person, your body to your part, to your, your spouse. God's will for the believer. According to verse 3 and 4 is holiness. But I want you to see something else. God's will for the believer is also to be harmless in this area of sexual relations. To be harmless. Look at verse 6. <clears throat> that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. He's talking about sexual relationships. By the way, uh, in the Bible, you know, the brothers involve the sisters as well. It's talking about brethren, uh, the male and female members in a local church. That's what he's talking about here. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth not man, that, that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given us his Holy Spirit. God's will is holiness, and God's will is that we live harmless in our sexual relationships. You know, it's possible, and you may be doing this yourself or have done this. It's possible to rationalize and think, well, you know what? My immorality isn't really hurting anyone because maybe it's not an act. Maybe it's just in your thought life. And so you rationalize, you know, I'm not hurting anyone. No one else knows about what I'm thinking or what I'm looking at, what I'm viewing. And uh, so I'm not physically hurting anybody to indulge in, let's say, pornography. Very clearly here, it hurts God. Number one, it hurts God. Any type of fornication, including pornography, it hurts God. In fact, he says in that eighth verse that if you reject and cancel the word of God that demands sexual purity... You're making null and void God's word by refusing to obey it. And as a result, you're dragging God's name through the mud. When it becomes an outward act, the people, the world that is watching, you give them a reason to not believe the gospel. And you give them a reason to blaspheme God's name as well. You remember when David committed adultery with Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet called him on it? One of the things that Nathan told him in 2 Samuel 12, 14 is that you have given a, an opportunity for the enemies of God to blaspheme God's name. 
So it hurts God. We're not, we're to live harmless, not to hurt God. And by the way, it hurts you too. It hurts you as the perpetrator. Because the Bible says that uh, you sin against your own body. I'm not going to read the verse, but 1 Corinthians 6.18 says that when you commit fornication, you sin against your own body. In fact, Paul says that there are natural consequences that come from, in, uh, from involvement in sexual immorality, that the judgment of God is contained in the sin itself. Sometimes it leads to venereal disease even uh, and deadly disease. And sometimes you get shot dead because you cheated another man of his wife. So there's natural consequences. You hurt yourself. You know, it's like if I get in my car going home today and the speed limit says 25 miles an hour and I'm going 55 miles an hour and I, I don't make it around that curve and I hit that tree or that, uh, that uh, brick wall, there's consequences. God has set up a, a roadway, if you will, for sexual purity. And when we leave that roadway of marriage, we wreck. We wreck our lives. And not only that, it hurts you because we are told in verse 6 that God is the avenger of people that are believers that do not practice sexual morality or purity. He avenges that. What does that mean? It means God will not let you off the hook. If you make null and void by uh, his word, by ignoring what he says, God's going to chasten you if you're his child. How? I don't know. But he's going to chasten you. Because the Bible says, whom God loves, he chastens. And he scourges every child that he receives. As a child, I was scourged on a regular basis. My dad spanked me on a regular basis, and I didn't like it then, but I'm glad he did. Now, as I look back on it, and I'm much wiser. But, you know, uh, who knows what I would have got into if he hadn't. The fact of the matter is God loves us too much to let us just do our own thing and get off scot free. It doesn't happen that way. That's not how a, a loving father deals with his children. And so God is the avenger. God is going to see to it that you're chasing for your wrongdoing. Remember Esau? Esau was that kind of a guy. And you know what, what was at the root of his adultery? You know what was at the root of Esau's sexual immorality? You read it in Hebrews 12, 15, and 16. He was bitter. He was angry and bitter at his brother. He, he was bitter with, with, with circumstances that happened in his life. And as a result, he became a fornicator. Be careful about bitterness. Bitterness will drive you at times into immorality. Don't be bitter against mom and dad. Don't be bitter against your siblings. Don't be bitter against your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Don't have a bitter heart. See God in everything. See how he, he allows and permits things to enter our life because he wants us to come to him with them. Don't be bitter. It could drive you to sexual immorality. It hurts not only God, but it hurts you. Thirdly, you look at verse 6, it's very clear that sexual immorality hurts others. The word defraud there in that sixth verse means to go beyond, or actually he says the word go beyond, that no man go beyond and defraud. The words go beyond have the idea of crossing a line. When you are involved in fornication, you cross the line that God has established. You break out of God's boundaries. And then he says, go beyond and defraud their brother. The word defraud means to cheat. The word defraud means to selfishly take advantage of another person. Tell that person how much you care for them and love them, only to get selfishly the 
sexual pleasure that you want from them by using them. Cheating another by having a sexual relationship with their spouse instead of your own. Or you cheat your sexual partner as well. You, it could be that you rob them of their virginity. Or it could be that you rob them of the blessing of, uh, of a, 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 a balanced and, uh, and good sexual relationship with their future spouse. You, you hurt and you rob even their spouse in the future that they perhaps have not even met just for your own sinful pleasure. So we're to live harmless and not hurt God, not hurt others, not hurt ourselves. One of the best books that I've ever uh, read on the subject is called The Altar of Sexual Idolatry by Steve Gallagher. He was, he was a, a, an addict himself, a sexual addicted uh, man before God set him free. And this is an excellent book. I just want to read a couple of excerpts. Deeply embedded within the heart of man is a spiritual altar. Every human has the capacity, no, the need to worship. The objects of that worship are the things or persons which have taken the, the preeminent position of importance in our lives. Whatever they may be. They cast their looming shadow over all of the other aspects of, of the life. In this position in the human heart that God demands to occupy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Unfortunately, in our fallen spiritual condition, man's natural tendency is to give that affection to something else. For many... The powerful human drive for sex becomes the overriding passion of life. Kept in its proper place, sex is a marvelous means for a married couple to physically express their love to each other. However, when a person begins to indulge in some form of, e of illicit sexual behavior, this passion can quickly get out of control. Over time, this ravenous beast takes over and begins to drive the person's life Thus, his sexuality and capacity to worship becomes fused into a corrupted, nearly irresistible drive to worship at the altar of sexual idolatry. Hence the title of the book. As the addiction tightens its grip on the victim, he enters into special routines or rituals to which he becomes accustomed. The addict's personal fantasy is what uh, is what dictates his particular routine and once an individual becomes addicted to sex he enters into a vicious cycle of self-destruction and degradation i want to close with this if you've messed up in the past there's complete forgiveness for you and if you haven't taken that forgiveness take it now because if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But I would say this, if you are currently stuck in sexual sin, there's also hope for you. To summarize how to be sexually pure, here it is. Verse 5, know him. Don't be like the pagans that don't know God. That's what he says in verse 5. So it begins by knowing him, seeking God in his word with your whole heart. Instead of seeking what you want, instead of seeking your self-interest, become grateful instead of lustful. As you seek God with your whole heart in his word, you'll begin to develop a grateful heart toward him. And that leads to a desire then to choose his will over your will. And you'll begin to love God and you'll begin to love others more than you love yourself. Verse three, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. You'll begin to love God and his will more than you love yourself and your will. 
and that will prompt you then to take full advantage of his Holy Spirit that indwells you and desires to fill you or enable you. That's verse 8. He's given unto us his Holy Spirit, and that's in the context of ability to say no to sexual sin. By asking and by taking that enablement that he offers. And when you do, you know what happens? Romans 8 says, the spirit of life, he completely counteracts and overcomes sin and its grip in your heart and life. It's a wonderful truth.